Good morning, church. It's good to be with you all. Um, thank you so much for everybody who's participated in putting this program together. I've uh, really been enjoying what's been happening lately because I, we're starting to see more people share their talents, share what's going on at home, and um, just so blessed by it all. So thank you, everybody, for participating. Uh, if you're new to Lilydale, uh, my name's Pastor Ryan, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, this morning as uh, we try to worship via online means. Um, you might have noticed, um, maybe you haven't, but I've got a haircut and... Uh, this is uh, the first uh, COVID lockdown haircut, and uh, there was a it was a tense moment in the Vito home, but I think Emma's done a good job. So uh, Emma, if you're watching, thank you. This is me just uh, yeah mending the, the the bumpy road that took to make this haircut. <laughs> anyway, um, it's good to be with you all. We are getting into the Book of Acts once again. If you've not been with us for the last few weeks, we've been journeying through the Book of Acts and uh, what a journey it's been. Um, we've covered so much content and um, we're going to see a shift in the story today. I'm just going to pick up my clicker here. I've entitled today's message, um, and let's have a go, the gospel goes to the Gentiles. So I've been asked to put my clicker down. Uh, I'm not using a clicker, even though I've got one. I'm not sure what that's about, but all right. So um, we're going to go into the gospel goes to the Gentiles. And on the first slide that I have for you, we see um, a little summary of what's going on. We're looking at chapters 10, 11, and 12. And in chapters 10, 11, 12, we have uh, Peter journeys to Caesarea, the mission to Antioch, and Peter's exile story. Now, I'm going to look at the first two points today because thematically they work quite well and for time reasons, that's all we're going to be able to cover. But just by uh, a little bit of a way of explanation, the third point, Peter's exit story, happens in chapter 12. It's a powerful story and uh, King Herod realizes that persecuting Christians works to his advantage. And so he puts to death James, the brother of John, and he takes Peter and puts him in jail. And uh, there's this miraculous escape. An angel comes and Peter leaves. He comes to the home of Mary, who is the mother of John Mark, who is the author of the book of Mark. And it's this beautiful story, but we're not going to be able to look at it today. So I encourage you to check it out. Uh, Pastor Faye has also put some great uh, devotional series on our Facebook page where you can see more of that story. But today we're actually going to dive into chapter 10 and chapter 11. And we're going to have a look at uh, this shift in the story. And so we're going to start with Peter's journey to Caesarea. Okay, Peter's journey to Caesarea. Now we're going to pick up uh, our story in chapter 10 and verse 1. The text is going to be up there on the screen for you. So in chapter 10 and verse 1, uh, it says, In Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. So here we're introduced to a city called Caesarea and to a centurion. Now, what do we know about Caesarea? Caesarea is a beautiful part of the world. You can still visit it today. And uh, if you go there today, all you will see is ruins and rubble. There's a little photo there in uh, the bottom uh, bottom part of the screen. And uh, I've been there. It's such a stunning place. And um, it was built by the very first King Herod, and he made it one of the seats of his kingdom. Now, I've got another picture for you to show you what Caesarea would have looked like back then. It was a port city, and uh, uh, it was the base of, uh, of a Roman legion. Uh, there were several places throughout Judea where the Romans had garrisons of soldiers, and this happened to be one of those places. And we are told that Cornelius, our centurion, lives in this particular city. So there you can see some of the what the town would have looked like. But what do we know about Cornelius? Um, well, the fact uh, that he is a Roman centurion gives us a lot of clues as to details about who he is. We know that he is a Gentile. We know that he is Roman. Uh, to be a centurion, uh, you would have earned your Roman citizenship. 
So he's uh, not just a foreigner. Roman, the Roman army was made up of people from all over the empire, but not necessarily Romans. Having Roman citizenship was very powerful, very important. Um, but he's also a non-commissioned leader. Now, what does that mean? As a centurion, you weren't an officer who had come through officer school. You were an officer who had worked his way up through the ranks. You had started as a private in today's vernacular, just the lowest rank, and you'd worked your way up. You were every man's soldier. And it's worth noting that every time a centurion is mentioned in the Bible, it's done so in a positive context. Yes, the Romans are bad, the bad guys of the story more often than not. Uh, the gospel writers, the writers of the New Testament wanted you to see that these were men of faith. These were people who had experienced so much through the course of life on the battlefield, in leadership. Somehow it had conditioned them to be great recipients of the gospel. And sometimes I feel like I needed to go through their school of life uh, so I could uh, learn some of the things that they learned to have the faith that they had. So that's kind of what we know about Cornelius on the surface. But Luke gives us some deeper details in verse 2. He says that Cornelius was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. Now, this is a very important detail because in this chapter, what we're going to see is we're going to see that uh, the, the mission of Jesus, the Jesus movement, is not just limited to people of Jewish extraction. It's going to be open, wide open to Gentiles. People have no Jewish heritage at all. And Luke puts this detail about who Cornelius is, I think, for a very good reason. Because it would be so easy to walk down the street and to look at somebody like Cornelius and make a face judgment. To say, there's a dirty Roman, there's a pagan, there's someone who's defiling our country. But all the while he has these amazing qualities, qualities that any Christian today would love to have. So what, do, what are those qualities? Well, we're told that he's devout. We're told that he fears God. We're told that he leads his family, his household spiritually. He gives generously of his wealth to the Jewish people and he prays regularly. This guy is a hero and not just on the battlefield, but spiritually he's a person we should all want to be like. And look, this whole uh, episode has just left me feeling I need to study more about centurions and their faith. And so, friends, the first point I think I take from this, this study is not to judge a book by its cover. And how often are we guilty of doing that? So Cornelius, great guy. Um, what else do we know about him? Well, the story picks up in verse 3 and says, One afternoon at about 3 o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? He answered, your prayers and arms have ascended as a memorial before God. So there's some really interesting details in this uh, encounter. Cornelius, being the person of prayer that he is, is praying at three o'clock. Now, to the, to the average reader, you would gloss over that detail, and I, in fact, did. And going through some of my commentaries, I didn't realize that three o'clock was a time of sacrifice, the afternoon sacrifice. It was also, therefore, a time of prayer. So we're seeing that he's not only described as a person of prayer, but he, he's a person that would probably have been engaging in prayer at this point in time. And so God comes to him uh, in the form of this angel, with a message. And he's told that his prayers and his arms giving have been noticed. It's a really interesting detail because as Christians, we uh, have taught for so long um, that we experience righteousness by faith alone. No works that we do uh, can earn uh, God's favor in our lives. But here we actually see that Cornelius' giving, Cornelius' prayers, God is noticing it. And I think by way of explanation, we can see that maybe God is noticing the heart 
that is doing these actions. God can see the motive that is driving Cornelius to pray, to give. Jesus in the Gospels has condemned people for giving and for praying with the wrong motives. But Cornelius seems to be someone who does it with the right heart, with the right attitude, and with the right spirit. So this is really important. It's, it's something that God is noticing in his life. Now, meanwhile, I'm going to jump over a little bit, but in verse 9, we see a story pick up the next day with Peter. Peter, it says, it's at noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on a roof to pray. So Cornelius sends a convoy, and meanwhile, uh, Peter is on a roof, he's praying in the great, uh, o- great open wide, wide open. Um, I'm losing my words. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. I didn't realize this until I started preparing for this, but usually Jewish people only ate two meals a day. Romans were more inclined to eat three meals a day. And, uh, it seems that perhaps this is the first meal of the day. It's about midday. And uh, Peter's definitely working up a hunger. And it's a little detail, but I think it makes what follows all the more significant. In verse 11, Peter has this vision. It says, he saw the heavens open and something like a large seat came down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, get up. Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. So Peter has this vision, this dream, and it's very profound. Uh, I think God's funny because I I had one of these this week. Uh, The dream wasn't profound. I was being chased. Uh, But I didn't realize how much it was affecting me until Emma shook me awake and I woke up And she goes, are you okay? I'm like, yeah. And I went back to bed. Well, the next morning I said to Emma, what was that all about? She goes, man, you were breathing really heavy, like panting. And I was shaking you for a good minute or two before you woke up. I'm like, oh, wow. And I just said, well, I'm not going to tell you what I was dreaming about, but it just felt so real. Something was chasing me. Uh, I don't have nightmares very often, but it just made this experience of this passage all the more real. I can imagine Peter being there, he's hungry, as we've just seen. And now he's in this dreamlike state and he he's told, hey, kill and eat all of these different animals. Some of them were biblically clean. Some of them were unclean. We're just told all four-legged animals were being presented to him in this dream. Now, what makes this dream a little bit more Uh, I don't know, it takes it closer to home for me, is the fact that we have this word that Peter's told, he's told to kill and eat. But I didn't realize that the word kill, more often than not in the New Testament, is actually translated sacrifice. And so there could be an argument made where Peter is being told to sacrifice unclean animals to God. And that just rattles him. And I can see that. I remember when I was at Avondale, we were studying uh, the the period between the Old and the New Testament. And there was this Greek ruler who came to Israel and he made the Jewish people sacrifice pigs on the altar. And it was such an abomination. And, And I'm just imagining that. And Peter's just mortified by this idea of presenting something. Now, many Christians have argued that this is a passage which is inviting us to eat whatever you want. Get some pork on your fork, I think, was the old ad campaign. And uh, growing up in an Adventist Catholic home, this passage was often presented to me as to why I should be eating hot dogs and spam and pork crackling. And as I've grown older, this passage has had a lot of interest to me for that very reason. But in the next few verses, I think we see that The immediate context tells us that this is not about what you eat. In verse 15, Luke tells us, The voice said to him again a second time, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. 
Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision that he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. The very fact that Peter is puzzled tells me that the immediate command to kill and eat is not the invitation that Peter feels is being made to him because he literally doesn't go out and goes, oh, okay, now I'm just going to go do that. So it seems to be something deeper than what he's just seen. And the story that follows is going to tell us what the dream really means, or Peter's going to give us the answer himself. So the people at his home or the residence that he's in say to him in verse 22, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So I just want to pause there for a minute, but... Cornelius's entourage describe him as a God-fearing man. And whenever you see that word, God-fearing man, you're to think of a person, a Gentile, who is enmeshed in Jewish society, who is uh, on his journey to becoming a Jew, but quite hasn't taken the step. And that final step is literally circumcision. And so we, have, we see from what Luke has said that Cornelius is a man on that journey. He participates in the community life. He gives generously. He prays. But he hasn't taken the final step to, to circumcision, to, to sealing the deal, so to speak. Verse 23 says, So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day he got up and went with them, and some of the believers from Joppa accompanied him. So I've highlighted that some of the believers accompany him, and the simple reason for that is because I believe Peter wants to have a record of what he's doing. He wants there to be witnesses to what's going. He's, he's in uncharted waters here. No good Jewish person has gone into the home of a Gentile, of a Roman soldier. And so he wants witnesses to follow to see what God is up to. So when he does eventually come back and report what's going on, it can be above board and that there can be evidence of what he's done. So he eventually gets to Cornelius's home. And when he arrives there, he sees that Cornelius has been busy at work. Verse 27 tells us, and as he talked with them, he went in and found that many had assembled. The verses before tell us that Cornelius has gathered his friends and family. Verse 28 says, and he said to them, you yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. And here Peter tells us that now he understands the point of the dream. Yes, he was told to kill, to sacrifice, to eat. But here he says, now I understand what God was trying to say. God has been laying down the way for me to come to your home. He's trying to brace me to enter into your place. I should not call anyone profane or unclean. Verse 29 says, so when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now may I ask why you sent for me? So he knows that God sent him. He knows that God has brought him into this environment that traditionally would have made him unclean. And I just want to pause there because Peter's realization, I think, is something that we need to wrestle with. I think for many Christians, we have appreciated the idea that salvation, that experiencing Jesus is not just for Jewish people, but it's for all people. It's for Gentiles. It's for Jews. But the real question I want to dig in with you at this point in the message is, who do you stigmatize? Who are those people in your life that you hold at arm's length? Who are the people that you are afraid to affiliate with, to associate with, to invite to your home for a meal or for a cup of tea and cake? Those are the people I feel Jesus is wanting us to think about with this message. Who are the people that we are so used to holding at arm's length? You know, I, or most of you know that my wife and I and our family, we live in Dandenong and 
you know, literally a month before we got the call to Lilydale, we had just moved into this home and the timing couldn't have been more worse. Um, we would have definitely moved out this way. But then, you know, we had kids and our families expanded and it's just been convenient to stay there. And growing up in Endeavour Hills, Dandenong was never a place that you were like, when I grow up, I'm going to live in that town. You know, it was a place where, you know, sketchy things happen. It wasn't known for being this a wonderful, amazing place and uh, still isn't to this day. It's been one of the epicenters of COVID-19. But friends, as I've lived in this place, as I've done life in this place, God has started to break those barriers inside of me. And God has challenged me to think, don't call this place unclean that I call clean. What are the places in your life? Who are the faces that you are inclined to hold at bay? The people you're inclined to not engage with. This is at the heart of this message. So our story continues though. And we see that Peter starts to share a word. Cornelius feels convicted that God wants Peter to share a message. It says in verse 33, so now all of us are here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say. And verse 44 concludes uh, this, this message that Peter shares. And we see the effect of that. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. So friends, I really need to say this, but God it needs all of us. He needs you. He needs me to share his word, to share his message. This is the way people will encounter Jesus. People find salvation, salvation if and when they respond to God's leading. That's one of the big points I took out of this story. Peter chose to be available to Jesus, even though Jesus was leading him into some uncharted waters. And because he was faithful to that call, somebody was able to find salvation. In fact, a whole household. And what I love about this story is, is that it doesn't take place in Jerusalem. It doesn't take place in the temple. And, and you can argue that this story is not taking place, quote unquote, in a church. It doesn't happen at synagogue. It doesn't happen in all of those traditional environments where we think Jesus needs to call people. It happens in somebody's home. And friends, this is all the more reason for us to think differently. Where is God calling us to go? How can we be more open to his leading? You see, I dare say had Peter not gone into Cornelius's home, that whole household would not have encountered this salvific message. So where is God leading us? Doing church, sharing Jesus is a 24-7 thing. It wasn't a Sabbath. Peter took a very long journey to get to Cornelius's home. And so we need to start thinking more laterally about where God is leading us. We need to be more open to where he's leading us today. And so whilst I've skipped over the content of Peter's message, I wanted to dot point some of the things that he details. And I think it's worth noting because perhaps these are the kinds of things we need to be sharing with people we come into contact in a day-to-day -day basis. Even though we're in lockdown, these are things we can do. So what are some of the things that Peter shares in this message? Number one, he shares that God is impartial to all humans, regardless of your religious background, your ethnic background, your social position in life. God is impartial. God sees all of us the same way. And that is an amazing news when you're a Roman centurion who feels so bad for occupying a nation and you know that the people of that country despise you. God loves Cornelius. People need to know that God loves them too. Peter continues by sharing Jesus's message of peace, a message that brings healing. He talks about the lordship of Jesus. Jesus is superior to every other God out there. And he talks about the anointing of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. God came in power over Jesus for Jesus to conduct the very mission that he, he did in the Gospels. Peter also talks about the disciples were witnesses to the things that Jesus did. There's evidence of what Jesus did. It's not just a made up story, but people have seen. He talks about the death 
and the resurrection of Jesus. There were witnesses to these events as well. He talks that Jesus is going to be the judge over all of us, both the living and the dead. But in the person of Jesus, you can also receive forgiveness through him. This is literally the content of this message. And if there's something that I'm leaving with, also another thing that I'm leaving as we study the book of Acts, it's to go deeper into these messages that Peter and Paul preached to these people because there's power in these messages. And we'll see why there's power. Verse 47 to 48 says, Can anyone withhold um, water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? You see, as Peter shares this message, the Holy Spirit manifests itself in this powerful, powerful way. We see the the similar uh, evidences that showed up on the day of Pentecost. And so Peter ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then... And they invited him to stay for several days. When Peter no doubt shares more about who Jesus is. What I find so interesting about this particular story, friends, is that Cornelius and his family are filled with the Holy Spirit before they were baptized. Today, uh, as a pastor, and I know our, our pastoral team is no different, or our elders, or maybe you, we will do Bible studies with someone. And, you know, once people have amassed enough information, well, then, OK, have you, you, do you have enough pieces of the puzzle to choose Jesus? And they'll say yes, no. And if they say yes, we'll baptize them. And hopefully there's going to be plenty more of that in our um, updated uh, baptismal font and uh um, Amity, hopefully you're going to be some one of those people soon. I'm, I noticed you in the font there, um, which is really cool. But friends, I couldn't help but notice the sanctuary imagery in this passage. You see, Peter's vision, he was being invited to sacrifice, invited to kill in a sacrificial way and to eat. And I can't go into detail on this because of our time. But friends, when you understand the symbols of the sanctuary, it wasn't just this tent, this dusty old tent in the Old Testament, but in it was a a pathway on how people could encounter Jesus. Jesus himself lived at every single aspect of this building. And I'm not going to go to details how he does that. But here I see Cornelius in his heart dying to self. He is laying himself on the altar and Peter notices this. And it's at this point that the Holy Spirit is able to fill him and all of his home. Friends, we are being invited to be conduits to help Peter, people die to self. What is God calling you to do? How is God inviting you to be available to do what he needs to do in our community today? So this concludes our episode in Caesarea, and I'm skipping over a part where um, where Peter goes back to Jerusalem and he repeats everything that happened exactly as it happened. And uh, for time, we're just going to continue on. And so the next part of the story focuses on the mission to Antioch, the mission, mission to Antioch. And so in verse 19 of chapter 11, we pick up some interesting details. It says, Now those who were scattered because of persecution that took place over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and they spoke the word to no one except Jews. But among them were some men of Cyprus and Cyrene on coming to Antioch, And they spoke to the Hellenists also, proclaiming the Lord Jesus. So if you recall our earlier messages, Stephen has been persecuted, he's been stoned, and the church with it has also been persecuted, which leads to a dispersion of the Christian church that's based in Jerusalem. And we're told some of the places they go to, but in particular of interest to us this morning, they end up in the city of Antioch. And some of the Greek uh, Jews, the Greek Jewish Christians, that's a mouthful, but Jewish converts who are Greek in heritage, they start to share uh, Jesus with some of the Greeks who are in the church. Just like Cornelius was a Roman who participated in Jewish life, there were Greeks who participated in Jewish life. And so they start to share. But what do we know about the city of 
um, Antioch. Well, actually, I'm going to have to go back one of my, my, to one slide. But the question I have is, where are the low-hanging fruit in your life? It seems that these disciples were, were seeing people who were eager to, to encounter Jesus, and they made the most of sharing him. And friends, for the most part, these early parts of the Christian movement, uh, converts were made in synagogues. It was low-hanging fruit. And so I thought it was a really good question to ask, where are the low-hanging fruit in your place, in your life? Um, but what I wanted to show you is where Antioch is. I'm a visual person, and uh, up on the screen should be a map, and you'll see where Antioch is. There's the Roman Empire, and you'll see on the right-hand side of your screens a little arrow, and it's got uh, the city of Antioch. Antioch today is in modern Turkey, but uh, back then it was a Syrian uh, city. And in fact, it was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. I had no idea about this. The third largest city. It was established in 64 BC um, by um, one of Alexander the Great's generals, uh, Seleucus. And it's a huge city, even by today's standards. It compromised of 1,000 100 city blocks, according to archaeologists. And think of one city block as being approximately 120 by 50 meters, 1,100 city blocks. This is a large city, friends. There were conservatively 250,000 inhabitants, but some scholars say there were as many as half a million, and some even say 700,000. It's hard exactly to say, but this isn't a small city by any means. Uh, the Jews of the city actually made up a quite a large community. Uh, there were, I think, about 20,000 or so Jews, and they seemed to be quite wealthy, quite prominent. And they made the Jewish faith attractive to many of the Gentiles. And so that's why we see a lot of Greeks who were worshipping with the Jews. So this is a large city. And it just got me thinking, you know, friends, I think today for many of us, we feel that there's a challenge to sharing Jesus in a large city like Melbourne. There's, it, it can be hard because uh, we, we feel overwhelmed. There's just so many people. Why would they be interested in what we're doing? And I have a question that I want you to, to, to think about. But friends, there are low hanging fruit in the city of Melbourne today. Again, I want to make that point. But friends, don't be afraid. Darren said in his in his uh, pastor spot video, don't be afraid. You know, things are going to be okay. God is empowering us to go out with the message that he has given us. And so, friends, in Melbourne, I 110% believe that there are low-hanging fruit today. I could give you stories, but for time's sake, I'm just going to continue. And so the other thing I think that comes out of this story is that God takes life's bad events and he uses it for good. You see, this persecution, nobody at that time would have thought it was a good thing, but it leads to the expansion of the church. Now, we could say that, that, that Cornelius's uh, conversion and the conversion of the Gentiles in um, Antioch was a planned thing, but it clearly wasn't. This is God moving in the lives of his people. This is God laying down a pathway and friends, it's just made me realize that we need to be all the more attuned to where God is leading today. And so I really want you to think through this question, and this is an important question I really want you to wrestle with, but what work is God trying to do today in our COVID-19 season? What is God trying to do? to wake us up to. As a pastoral team, we've slowly becoming uh, um, aroused to the idea that God is really wanting to leverage the internet today. He's really wanting Lilydale to lean into this medium. And I want to say thank you to the AV team for all the hard work they've been doing. Um, without them, our messages wouldn't be going out. But we've been engaging people, not just in the city of Melbourne, but from across the country and around the world even. And if you're one of those people, we want to welcome you into our family. But how can you think differently? Where is God leading us today? And friends, I'm going to be honest with you. This is a question every Christian is asking right now. 
What are we going to be doing differently? How do we need to change? How do we need to evolve how we do church? This is a question I'm seriously asking you to pray for through. I really want to come out the other side of this as a community, walking in the direction that Jesus is leading us in. And so the church in Jerusalem, anyway, pick up what's been going on in Antioch. And in verse 22, it says, news of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Barnabas is a great guy. And what do we know about Barnabas? This is his third appearance in the book of Acts. His name is Son of Encouragement, as many of you Bible scholars will know. But whenever you see Barnabas, he's often seen encouraging, building up the church, connecting people, encouraging the saints. And, and what, a, what a great person to have in your community, a person like Barnabas. And it, we're told that he, in verse 24, was a good man filled with the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were brought to the Lord because of him. Friends, the church doesn't send Barnabas because of his 10-point plan and 20-point strategy as to how to engage the city of Antioch. He is sent to Antioch because he's filled with the Spirit. He's full of faith and he's just a good guy. I just love the simplicity of how the church acted. And friends, it clearly bore results. And so I think, you know, we're being encouraged to emulate this guy, Barnabas. Let's continue in Acts 11, verse 25. It says, then Barnabas went to Tarsus. He sees the work that's happening. He's encouraged, but he realizes we're going to need to pull out some heavy guns. So he goes to Tarsus to look for Saul. And verse 26 says, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for an entire year. They met with the church and taught a great many people. And it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. What I love about this story is, you know, we're seeing a transition in leadership and focus. Paul and Barnabas are going to be the drivers of the church movement now. In chapter 13, which we're not going to look at, this is, we're going to, this is Peter's farewell story. We're not going to see the apostles anymore. The apostles are always mentioned in the book of Acts if they're present. But now we're going to see a, a, a handing over to the elders. And uh, one of Jesus' brothers, James, in fact, becomes one of the leaders of the church. We have one of his letters in our Bible. But what I love about Barnabas here is he actually defers to somebody who's better than him. And there's no sense of pride. There's no sense of jealousy. This isn't Barnabas building up his kingdom. This is Barnabas building the kingdom of heaven. And friend, it's really taught me, I'm going to be honest, but in ministry, I have been petty. I have had jealousies. I have moments where I've been looking at other people in envy and going, man, oh, I need to be more like them. And what I'm seeing in the person of Barnabas is a need to just lay all of that aside to put all of those things, those personal sort of things I have inside of me aside and go, no, this is all God's kingdom. This isn't Ryan's kingdom. It's not Faye's kingdom. It's not Darren's kingdom. This is God's kingdom. And his work is the most important work that needs to happen. And because of this, they're so effective of what they're doing that for the first time in history, the term Christian is used, most likely by Romans. It's an interesting term, but it has Greek elements and Latin elements and Hebraic elements. But literally Christian means an anointed one. And these were the anointed ones who are following after Jesus. What an amazing title to have. These people were so effective at what they were doing that the community was noticing. And I've said this in this sermon series before, and I'm going to say it again. Wouldn't it be amazing if the greater, you know, Yarra Rangers, if the east of Melbourne, in fact, if all of Melbourne and the world could hear of what Lilydale Church is doing, if they could give us some crazy tag, those, those crazy sevies, I don't know. But it's coming out of the work we're doing on behalf of Jesus for his kingdom movement. So friends, this is bringing to an end this section. Like I said, we're not going to be looking into chapter 13. And um, I just want to say thank you for journeying with us this morning. I'm going to pray for us now and uh, we're going to uh, fade out. But thank you for joining us today. Father in heaven, Lord, I just wanted to um, say thank you for this story that we have here 
in Acts. There's an invitation that's being made in chapters 10 and 11, and that invitation is to lay down all of our prejudices, lay down our pride, lay down those things that we've been conditioned to hold against other people. For you to come, you said your gospel need to go to all the ends of the earth, even to the people that we are most uncomfortable with. And so, Father, I just want to pray that you will help reveal to us in our own lives the people that we've stigmatized, the people that we are afraid to interact with. These are the people that you are inviting us to share your final message with. Thank you that these uh, great pioneers of the Christian movement were so brave in, in just sort of laying that down. People like Peter and Barnabas and Paul. Without them, we wouldn't have the record that we have. Without them, we literally wouldn't be here today, all of us being Gentiles. So thank you so much. And Father, give us the boldness to lean into what you're doing. May we pray and ask you to reveal what it is you're wanting to do in our city, in our towns, in our communities today. And may we follow wherever you go is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, friends.